In photography, there is something known as the exposure triangle. Now, what is the exposure triangle? Let me break it up for you. Now, exposure, it, it basically means how bright your image is, how much light is there in your image. So if there's, a, if, if there's too much light, your image would get washed out and it's termed as an overexposed image. And if there is too little light, your image would be very dark or black and it is known as an underexposed image. Now, what is the exposure triangle? Well, in a camera, there are three settings which help you decide the right exposure to take a picture. Now, those three sh settings are shutter speed, aperture and ISO. Uh, so, okay, now we have these settings and uh, we know what the exposure is, but what is this triangle, you ask? So these three settings are interconnected and uh, they are dependent on each other. Changing the value of one setting will need you to change the value of the other two. So you have basically have to find the perfect balance between all three of these settings. Since they are, all three of them are interconnected, it is drawn as a triangle and therefore it is called as the exposure triangle. Simple, isn't it? So in this video, we're going to be talking about the first concept that is shutter speed. To understand shutter speed, we need to understand how a camera works in the first place. Now let me show you my camera. I'm going to remove the lens. And if I bring up my mirror, you can see that there is something green in color in there. You can see my face over there and that is known as the sensor of the camera. Now this sensor is photosensitive, meaning that it is reactive to light. So what it does is that when the sensor is exposed to light, it basically captures it, it records the light and creates an image from the data that it received from the light rays. So but the sensor is not always exposed to light. If you see here, the, the sensor is somewhere over here and uh, it's there in eternal darkness. So how does it get light? There is a shutter in front of the sensor. Now this shutter is basically like a door for the light to go through. And this shutter needs to open for the light to go into the camera and hit the sensor. Now shutter speed decides how long that the sensor gets to see light. Or in other words, shutter speed is decides how long the door stays open for the light to go through. And uh, it's usually measured in seconds. And in any decent average camera, it goes all the way from 30 seconds to 1 by 4,000th of a second. Uh, advanced higher end professional cameras go up to like 1 10,000th of a second. How does this shutter speed work? Okay, so now we know that the shutter is a door for the light to go through and reach the sensor and shutter speed is how long the door stays open. But how does it contribute to the image brightness? Okay, so when the door stays open, basically light goes in. But when it stays open for a longer time, which means that more light gets to go in and therefore more light reaches the sensor and therefore the sensor creates a bright image. Your image will be well exposed. But then again, if your door is exp uh, shutter is open for a lesser amount of time, it means that less light will reach the sensor and therefore your image will be darker. But then again, if you think that, uh, okay, fine, so all I have to do is to use a nice long shutter speed to get a nice bright image. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. So see, uh, when you use a longer shutter speed, the problem is that uh, the camera needs to remain steady while you're taking a photograph. So if you shake, your camera would have a shake in your image. So when you use a longer shutter speed, there is an increased chance of a shake. But when you, uh, when you use a faster shutter speed, the, the chances of shake are pretty less. That's why photographers use tripods. Actually, not just tripods, there's a lot of different types of camera stands. There's tripods, there's gorilla pods, monopods, and there's gimbals, and there's so much more. So, in summary, we know that using a longer shutter speed will give you more chances of a shake, and using a shorter shutter speed will give you a lesser chance of a shake. Now, let me show you how shutter speed works. Let me remove this. And I'm gonna be clicking a picture in my camera. So right now I'm going to set my camera at 1 by 250th of a second and watch this uh, sensor get exposed. That's it. That was fast. The shutter basically went up and came down in a fraction of a second. But let me go slower. I'm going to go to two and a half seconds. Did you see? You could see that when I clicked the button for the second time, my sensor was exposed for a longer period of time. So that's basically how shutter speed works. Now let me show you an example. 
So these are uh, a series of images that I took at uh, different shutter speeds. So it's the same subject, water drops are falling from a tap. And the first image was shot at one by two hundredth of a second. And you can see that uh, it was not fast enough for us to capture the motion of the water drop. You can see the water droplets are all blurred. And this is because when you're using a longer shutter speed and there are objects moving in your frame, basically the sensor is recording all of that light and making it into one single image. So if a person is moving or let's say the water drops are falling, the sensor is capturing the water drop droplet moving down. It's capturing all that at the same time and making it into one image and showing the motion in that image. So this is called a motion blur where the motion of an object is visible in your image. Now let's go faster. At 1 by 500th of a second, you can see that we have gotten better at uh, freezing the water. But then again, it's not the best. You can see that at the bottom of the water droplet, they still shake. So let's go faster. 1 by 2,000th of a second. You can see that now we have frozen the uh, water droplet perfectly. You know, the water is there, frozen in space. So, and now we have no motion blur. When I keep these three images side next to each other, you can see that as we go from left to right, as we go from 200th of a second to 2000th of a second, you can see that our image is getting darker and darker. That's because the sensor is exposed for a lesser amount of time and therefore it is seeing lesser amount of light. This image, for example, is an image that I took way back in 2016. <clears throat> you can see that the uh, tuk-tuks, the vehicles, the auto rickshaws are frozen, they're steady, but the people have been moving in my frame. And therefore you can see that these two people on the far left, they're uh, all shaken. This man who's on the right side of the frame has moved drastically. Therefore he has become almost half invisible. And you can see that the tree has been swaying around in the wind and therefore you can see that the leaves are all blurred. The leaves have this motion blur. But then again, in the same image, you can see that on the road, in the background, you can see that there is a light trail. They are vehicle lights. Now how did I record the vehicle lights but not the vehicles themselves? That's because your camera records light, right? So it, uh, so vehicle lights, headlamps and tail lights are a source of light and therefore the camera recorded those lights moving through the road. But it did not record the cars because the cars were moving too fast for the camera to actually see what's happening. I shot this frame at like four seconds. So the car would have been gone in like a fraction of a second. So therefore the camera did not have enough time to see the actual car and therefore it was not able to record the car. So photographers use these kind of techniques to their advantage by uh, to create different kind of interesting images and maybe even some fine art images like this image by George Alexandru Novak. If he had taken this image in a uh, faster shutter speed, then the water would have been frozen and uh, it would have been just another ordinary image. But what this photographer decided to do is that he decided to use a longer exposure and therefore he decided to blur out the finer details of the water in the waterfalls. But he did capture the motion of the water and that creates this mystical looking beautiful photograph. This is a type of photography known as long exposure photography and it uses motion blur to its advantage. And this is a type of another type of long exposure photography known as light painting. So basically what a person does is a person moves too fast for the camera to record them. But they hold a source of light in their image like there were sparkles used in this image. They used the sparkles to draw these hearts and they ran to the next one and they ran to the next one and drew the next heart and uh, it created an interesting looking image. But motion blur is not always not preferred though. It's not like having a blurry object in your frame would ruin your image. Like this image, for example, shows a dancer's motion on a stage. This is a nice, really good, well-composed, fine art image. And in this image, a longer shutter speed has intentionally been used to give you that sense of motion of the vehicle moving through the road. Coming to shorter shutter speeds, they can create some interesting frozen frames too. Like uh, this is a series of images that I took of my friend who is a gymnast. I made him do some backflips, I made him run and I've created some interesting pictures here using a fast shutter speed. Okay, but now how do we use these techniques in Blender, inside of Blender? Now, one thing to remember is that the Blender camera is not 
a real camera. It's just a 3D simulation of a camera, meaning that the Blender's camera tries to imitate real life physics. It's not gonna get it perfect because it's just an imitation, it's a simulation. You should never expect Blender to perform like real world. The thing is, computers have this tendency to get things perfect. Actually, that's why computers were built in the first place to avoid human errors. And uh, getting the getting shaky images or uh, getting mo all motion blur in your images is not uh, perfect. It's actually an imperfection being used by photographers. Computers cannot create shaky images or motion blur. However, we now have motion blur inside Blender. It totally works different to how our normal camera works. But the reason why I, ha I explained the entire concept of shutter speed and motion blur is because understanding the, co uh, the concept is important because Blender has been is trying to imitate the real world motion blur. And even though it works differently, Blender would still have the same parameters as real world. So therefore, understanding the concept helps you to use the feature properly to its fullest and achieve the effect you want, not settle for what you get. And this is very important because I see a lot of tutorials where some people don't understand how depth of field works and uh, they just, you know, try to get the object in focus, but the background are uh, not in focus, but then, uh, so they increase the depth, depth of field and, they, and now they have the object entirely in focus, but the background is in focus too. And uh, they try to uh, adjust things, but it just doesn't work and they, they just settled for something that's in the middle of what they want and what they get. So it's not a good habit to settle for that. You should always get the effect that you want. So now let's head inside Blender. All right, we are now inside Blender and we have our default scene. I'm gonna delete all of these and I'm gonna add in a circle and I'm gonna change the fill type to end gone. I'm gonna go into front view and rotate this 90 degrees along the X axis. I'm gonna add in a camera and I'm gonna set it to this view and I'm gonna bring it back a little like that. Now I'm gonna bring up my timeline and um, I'm gonna animate the motion of this object moving from left to right by keeping it where I want in the first frame and I'm gonna set a keyframe for its location and uh, I might go to the uh, 10th frame and set a keyframe for it over here. And with that done, I'm gonna pick a frame that I like. I think I'll go for frame number five because it's nice in the middle of both of our keyframes. And I'm gonna change the uh, interpolation mode to linear so that we get a constant blur and not some speeding up. All right, uh, now I'm gonna uh, cut off all the environment lighting and I'm gonna add in a uh, material to our circle. I'm going to add in a new material, I'm going to delete the principal BACF and I'm going to add in an emission shader with a strength of 10 because I, we need a source of light. All right, and now we have our animation done. Let's go into the camera settings and let's enable motion blur. But it's not there. Why is the motion blur not there in the camera settings? Obviously, it happens in the camera, right? You would find the motion blur in the render settings over here. Why is the motion blur in render settings and not in the camera settings? That's because Blender's camera, like I told you, is just a simulation and it cannot recreate a motion blur. So what is Blender doing? How are we getting this motion blur here? It's because Blender is doing some compositing, like uh, the bloom for EV. It's 100% fake. This is not real motion blur. This is just a composited effect. And how it works is that now that we are rendering frame number five, Blender would render frame number four, five, and six. And Blender would find a way to merge all of these three together in a way that it looks like there is a motion blur. It's, it's just faking it. Let's enable motion blur. And now you should see that we have some settings here. We have the first setting is position. And when you click the drop down box, you get three options. Start on frame, center on frame, and end on frame. What are these? When you use start on frame, it means that the frame that you have selected will be the first frame for the motion blur, which, mean blender, which means the blender would render frames five, six, and seven. When, if you select center on frame, then frame number five would be at the center. Blender would render four, five, and six. 
If you render end on frame, Blender will render 3, 4 and 5, keeping 5 at the end. Uh, I'm gonna leave it at center on frame and then you have our shutter. Now, uh, people who don't know photography, who don't know how shutter speed works, would not understand this. Like I told you, Blender uses the same parameters as real world. So right, uh, this is basically in seconds, even though it may not see it. So Blender's shutter speed goes from 0 0.01 seconds, which is one by hundredth of a second, all the way to one second. By default, Blender should be at 0 0.5, that is half a second, and we are gonna leave it over there. And then you have an option called rolling shutter. There's none and there's top bottom. Rolling shutter is an effect which usually happens in film cameras and uh, older camera sensors, modern, most modern camera sensors don't do that. It's a type of distortion which happens when the object is moving. It is something that I will explain in this series as we go further. And a uh, shutter curve is something through which you can control the motion blur by using a curve. Uh, it's, too, it's a little too advanced so we're not going to be using that. So with this done and motion blur enabled, I am going to render this scene. My image has been rendered and you can see that Blender has given me a nice motion blur of this emission circle moving from left to right. Now we know how motion blur works but uh, for your reference I am going to be making two more renders showing you how it looks at, the, at 0 0.01 and 1 second. And now our image has been rendered at 0.01 seconds. And you can see that there isn't really much motion blur to look at because one by hundredth of a second is actually pretty fast. It might not be the fastest, but it's actually pretty fast. And uh, our object was moving slow enough for our camera to actually capture it. And therefore, there is not much motion blur. Now let's do it at one second. And at one second, you can see that we have a little more motion blur than what we did at uh, half a second. Looking at all three of these renders, next to each other you can see that as we go from 0.01 seconds to 1 second our strength of the motion blur increases. Now I decided to test Blender's motion blur. So what I did was I wanted to recreate like a yin yang image white and black going up with motion blur. So therefore what I did was I deleted the existing keyframes. I duplicated this circle after keeping it in the center and uh, I added in an empty between these two new two circles and then parented both of these circles to this empty and set keyframes for the empty's rotation. And then I went on to remove the emission material for the second circle and then added in a regular black material. And after that I brought back the world lighting because we have a black object and we need to be able to see it. And therefore I brought back the world lighting and hit render. And now our image has been rendered and you can see that Blender has done a horrible job and uh, doing this. For one thing, we can see that we don't have enough motion blur for this, for these uh, two circles to actually go around. Uh, that's because one second of X shutter speed can only give you so much motion blur. And the thing is, Blender's motion blur is actually not meant for making images. It's meant for animations. There's no point in having like a four second motion blur in an animation. Blender's motion blur has its own limitations. While you might not be able to recreate any light painting images in Blender, now you get an idea of what Blender can do and what Blender cannot do. One thing that I really like is that you can see that, remember my image where uh, the car was not visible but the car's lights were as a light trail? You can see that Blender has done a good job at replicating that. You can see that our emission material has come out rather well and uh, you can see that our normal diffuse material has started to become invisible. So had these circles moved faster, chances are this black circle would have been invisible. And that is about it for the first lesson from our Blender Camera Masterclass. Now we have understood how motion blur works and we now know the basics of motion blur inside Blender. There is another cool technique, very cool technique that I want to show you that uses motion blur. It's called zoom burst. You can look it up if you'd like to, but I would be showing it in the third part of this video series because zoom burst uses a little focal length and we will be covering focal length in our third part. The next part of this video series will be released tomorrow. So make sure that you don't miss out on it. Please hit the subscribe button below. And uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up so that more people can find it. Please share this video series with someone who you think would need this. And with that, I end this video.
I will see you in the next part tomorrow. Bye.